Hi, everyone. We have what I think is a pretty cool episode coming up for you today. Yep. Everyone in our cahoot is going to hear about urgency and different manifestations thereof. <laughs> We're talking about how there's a there's a type of urgency that it will crush your soul yeah. and a type of urgency that will grow your soul and how to tell the difference. So we hope you really enjoy today's episode and we will see you on the other side. Hi, I'm Martha Beck. And I'm Rowan Mangan. And this is another episode of Bewildered. You know this one. It's the podcast for people who are trying to figure it out. Yes, both of them. We are trying to figure things out. Maybe we're the only ones. Why are you? What are you trying to figure out, Rowie? <laughs> yeah, why is a longer why? question. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about the pressures of culture mm. on this podcast, Marty, and um, it's yeah. a very real issue for me. And lately I've been very aware of there, that there are certain cultural like phenomena that I, I don't fully appreciate. And sometimes okay. I think it's because I am not from America and sometimes oh. I think I am not from this planet. <laughs> but I had I like I feel like a lot of them a lot of these issues come out via my relationship with my hairdresser oh yeah <laughs> um, do you ever feel like that like that there's this it's sort of funny it's a funny relationship because you know every few weeks I go in there um take care of the old roots and um and where else and really you- does somebody just caress your head it's yeah yeah, it's nice, but <laughs> it's intimate. Yeah, that, I mean, that, yeah, that's kind of a different, different thing. I think we, <laughs> that, that's something we might want to explore further right. on on your end. But um, so for me, it's a place where I chat with someone who is in the culture, and and I realise that there are expectations that I don't, uh, mm-hmm. I'm not able to meet. So I um, I was having a conversation with her a while ago, and and she goes. Yeah, I broke up with my boyfriend okay. yesterday. And what I didn't understand is that it, it was the day after Valentine's Day. Oh. Or it was the, it was Valentine's Day when we were having the conversation. Oh. So she just went, yesterday. And I was left with this, <laughs> like, I knew there was something about it. And all I could say was like, wow, that's <laughs> recent? <laughs> And I just, it took, and then I, it was literally when I was walking out the door that I was like, oh, right, because of the Valentine. Yeah, okay. And so but this thing got me into big trouble at my most recent haircut. And you're aware of this, but I don't know if you're aware of the, the context that led up to it. So uh-huh. I'm having a, a hair crisis, basically. <gasps> and it's my own fault because I don't know about culture. So we were, there we were, me and my wonderful hairdresser, Bianca, mm-hmm. hashtag besties for life um and i said to her because it had been a while i said to her that the back of my hair was giving me mullet energy Uh it's like it was giving mullet i was like (laughs) this is giving mullet (laughs) and she nodded everything about mullet is filthy to me she nodded sagely Mm. that i said it was giving mullet and and i thought cool we understand each other I went out of there not realizing that I had had my mullet enhanced. Oh, yeah. If anything. I actually have seen this. Yeah. You said you would cut it off for me and you haven't. I think it's adorable. It's, I, I like it. It would fit in a ponytail at this point. It you got to do it. You got to put a little like 17th century dude, <laughs> little ponytail at the nape of your neck. Oh, my God. It's so horrifying. I've never had a mullet. But <laughs> I recently was very grateful to have a, a – younger family member take me aside when I was complaining about this and they said look here's the deal bro the like the young queers are all about the mullets now like that's a thing that people want so when I had said it's giving me mullet what she heard was nice work with the mullet let's do more (laughs) of that thinking that I was in touch with any sort of culture queer youthful or, or otherwise and it's just, it's so, it's just like I'm always left guessing about what I'm supposed to think, say, feel, or do about anything, you Marty. And, me both. and as a result, 
I now have a mullet. That's all I'm going to say about that. it's gorgeous. <laughs> I was confused because I looked up mullet and it can't, I don't know where the term was applied to hair, but it, it's a fish, a mullet. A mullet is a kind of fish. So okay. It's, it's like putting a fish on yeah, your Yeah, but head? You, guess what? Beehive. It's mm. a thing that bees live in. It's a hairdo. Mm. You're just going to have to live with that, my okay. darling. What are you trying to figure out? I am trying to figure out how our three-year-old, who has had two dogs in her life but not any other pets, well, the fish, there are fish in the pond in the backyard, but and she throws rocks at them and says she's trying to get their attention. <laughs> So, but she's recently become quite obsessed with hamsters, and I don't think she even sees them on television. I know she has a very rudimentary idea of what a hamster would be, because Mm -hmm. she recently was sitting on my lap and reached down and felt my knobbly kneecaps. And (laughs) babies don't have kneecaps. They couldn't crawl around on hard surfaces if they had kneecaps. They've just got little cartilage in there. And so there, and you also biologically have passed down to to Lila. Fairly smooth knees, but I. What your I knees are smooth? About. This is see just... if you had knobbly knees like me, you would know to worry about it. But you you were born with smooth knees, so you never even have to think about it. Is this like one another one of these cultural things that I'm unaware of? That some people are, are smooth need and some. <laughs> what, what is this? I'm I genuinely feel bony. like I'm in a fever dream right now. I'm generally bony. Like one of my kids once told me I was like waving my hands. She goes, "Don't wave those knuckle cups at me." Like <laughs> I'm just knobbly. I'm just a knobbly person. And right. um, so Lila gri- gripped my kneecaps and said. Whoa, Muffy, you've got some hamsters in your knees. I was like, she thinks hamsters are hard. <laughs> like, and then she later told you, all I've ever wanted is a hamster of my own. She's three. You don't even get to say all I've ever wanted. <laughs> Furthermore, Especially when you've literally never mentioned the word hamster before that day. Ever. And um, also she... Uh, she wants a whole hell of a lot of things. From the moment she, she emerged, she has wanted things. So I think it's unfair of her to say that all she's ever wanted is a hamster of her own. But she also well, thinks uh, I've got... Marty, what? Why does she think there's hamsters in your knees? Because I have hamster-shaped kneecaps. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I just... I don't think any of this is true. <laughs> well, I feel, ask I feel so lost. the child... From the mouths of babes come the truth. I've got hamsters in my knees, and um, and she has always wanted one of her own, and I'm a little frightened that I'm going to wake up uh, having my kneecaps <laughs> severed with with a sharp rock that she was using to get the, the attention of the fish or something. Oh, my God. You two have such a sweet relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's peppered with the fear of physical violence. Not not punitively, just that we're both rough and ready. <sighs> oh, dear. She was singing Let's... in the bathtub, I wash my body with strong, heavy vehicles. It was a song she made up. And, yeah, that's the kind there's of kid a lot she is. Of, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in her mind. Between washing your body with strong, heavy vehicles and muffy, you have hamsters, hamsters in your knees. Kneecaps. She's yeah. at an interesting point in her life. I'm not going to say age because I think it may just be her personality and not mm. her age. I don't know. Oh, yeah. We'll be right back with more Bewildered. We don't say this enough. We are so glad you're a Bewildered listener. And we're hoping you might want to go to the next level with us. By which I mean, if you rate... And review the podcast. It helps new people find us so we can keep bewildering new souls and you know how much we love that. Ratings are very much appreciated. Obviously, the more stars you give us, the more appreciation is forthcoming. Reviews are quite simply heaven and we read everyone and exclaim over them and we just love you all. Mwah. All right, let's move on to today's topic. Rowie, what is our actual topic for today? <laughs> So today we are going to discuss uh, one look every now and again I say it not often mm. but sometimes I do say it's not all about us. Ah, I know what? shocking shocking. <laughs> so we have decided to do a Be Wild Files episode today. Oh, I love a Be Wild Files. You 
the listener. The and listener. today, that lucky listener is Angela. Hi, and we're Angela. Gonna hear from her now. Hi, Marty and Ro. This is Angela. Thank you so much for your podcast. I love you both and feel like you're friends. I wanted to ask you a question about urgency. This is something I've been thinking about a lot in the last year. Whether, how you know when to move on urgency as something that is giving you information and wisdom about needing to move quickly and when you should be suspicious of it as um, something that's connected to white supremacy culture. So if you have wisdom on that, I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks. I love this question. I mean, ever since we heard it, we've been talking about it. We have all these ideas. And I notice my own, they're like spasms of urgency and how they yeah. get me in different directions. It's been a great thing to have highlighted in my brain box. <laughs> I just realized that one thing that's terrible is that I think it's been about six months since uh, Angela submitted this question. <laughs> so, <laughs> as far as urgency goes, we're not we're not really doing great. But yeah. the, uh, nevertheless, the point stands, and we think it's an excellent topic. Mm -hmm. I just want to, like, as a tiny little side note before we delve right in, if anyone's wondering about the link that Angela mentions between urgency and white supremacy, there is some really really cool stuff that you can read about this. It's a really legitimate comparison to make. And I just dug out a quote from Dr. Barbara Holmes, who has a book called Race and the Cosmos. And she says, just to give a sense of what that link is, she says, I agree that the social situation is urgent, but frantic responses to resilient problems will not solve mm. anything. So that's just like <gasps> part of the flavor of what, but read more about it because it's super interesting stuff. Frantic responses to resilient problems. Wow. That's yeah. like a description of my life. <laughs> 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 but my life is not nearly as fascinating as um, Dr. Barbara Holmes. So everybody go read her book. In the meantime, I can, to go from the sublime to the ridiculous, I've been thinking there are basically two different kinds of urgency. I've felt them both um, over the last, over the many weeks since Angela sent in her question. And it seems to me that there are two kinds of urgency. One is the urgency that comes from a cultural context, and it's a pressure on the individual to do something that serves the system. So it's very routinized, usually. You have to do this now. And it requires culture to exist. And when it does exist and it pressures people into doing things, it then builds up the culture and makes it more um, resilient, the problems more resilient. And, huh, so in a way, the culture is built of urgency. Like that's that's the substance yeah. that it's made of. Yep. And it's that's so fascinating. And I think we all probably have some experience of that um, that that quality of urgency mm -hmm. when it belongs to the system. Um, I was thinking about last week. The other day, I got myself into quite a froth. Like genuinely, I was bordering on a panic attack mm -hmm. about work, about a workload situation, not coping. I was really, really, really overwhelmed Yeah, because I had a lot to do and it was all due that day. It was a deadline situation. Eek. Deadlines are, are going to be an interesting part of this conversation, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't had enough sleep. There was kid stuff happening unexpectedly. There was like personal stuff happening and it just felt like all the demands and I went, Trumping along to where Marty was. Oh, I can't go. You were upset. I was. was um, I was like in that place where I was like, I just can't. I just can't. I just can't. It's not possible. I just I can't. <laughs> and and then Marty asked me an amazing question, and I'll never forget this, Marty. You mm. said to me, "What is it that you have to do?" Oh, that yeah, is that's that just... is driving you to panic. That is due today. That's a useful and question. I said, mm. Yeah, <laughs> and I said to her that look, the thing that is driving me to panic in this moment is that my deadline is for making a video for our colleagues about suggestions I have for an update to the brand with which we put out quotes by you on your <laughs> yes. social media. And she's like, 
<laughs> you need to, to do so, you need to tell people how something could look differently at some time. I'm like, <laughs> yes, I have. Mm, good point. And the real it world doesn't... impact is that there's a slightly different look to some of the quotes <laughs> we put out online. And, and it was such a fascinating moment to just like zoom out and feel, oh, right. So this doesn't matter totally so much. Doesn't matter. Actually, interesting, interesting. And and it was fun because you brought me back to real priorities, Aww. and and it was very helpful. Thanks for that. Like yeah. That. So you were in that. That intense, uh, what I call false urgency, or we've been calling it false urgency. The second kind of urgency is something we're going to hold back so that you'll be interested in hearing more it's about it. Surprise, it's a surprise if you're good. Yes, it's like a hamster. Yes. So <laughs> you were in this absolute nightmare of urgency over this really, really unimportant thing. Sorry, but it felt unimportant to me. And I was thinking about all. The stuff that Sorry, I correction, felt. correction. What? It is important. Mm -hmm. It wasn't urgent. Yes, and that's the whole the the old saw about um, do the things that are important but not urgent over the things that are urgent but not important. Don't let the urgent drive out the important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but but the so the urgent the false urgent things they come up a lot. And I've felt mm. them and you've felt them. I bet everybody listening to this has felt urgency over things that were really not that urgent, like getting a certain room clean. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's funny. It's like, and I feel like often those false urgencies are created around, um, they're sort of abstract, like, like, um, you know, systems, deadlines. Mm, yeah. You know, you've got a, and it's an invented Dead, the deadlines that are invented, hmm. I'm just, I mean, sometimes, look, if you work for a newspaper and the newspaper is printed and blah, 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 I mean, I'm not saying that there's no such thing as a deadline. I don't mean that. But I just feel like that in within workplaces and stuff, hmm. there can be a sense of urgency created that is a bit arbitrary sometimes. Yeah. And like, I've got to get the house clean. Bye yeah, time. I mean, like I did all my laundry the other day, and then I not all of it was put away, and I was like, "Oh, I can't do other things. I have to put all the laundry away first. And then it occurred to me that I could put like drape some of it over a chair and leave it till, well, sometime in the future because it's draped over the chair right now as we speak. But it's not <laughs> the end of the world. Someone complains so much about doing laundry. Well, it felt urgent. What can I say? <laughs> no, there's this thing. I mean, it's so interesting, the house cleaning thing, because um, that, I mean, I, th I think about all the ads I saw growing up on TV about where women were shamed for not having this house that was perfectly clean. And um, um, I also read a bunch of studies when I was doing sociology that showed that all these labor-saving devices that were supposed to free up women to do other things that were maybe important to them. Instead, they had raised the level of expectation of how clean everything would be. So there was so the urgency to keep things clean had gotten even bigger. And I, I like huh. cleanliness, but it can be insane when it gets, it's part of a social role. And I I've never had like an office job like you've had, but it seems to me that that gets really completely insane as well with the arbitrary deadlines. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. I want to say like 19 different things. Like one of them is how once we get on a roll like that, how insane it can be how, when we get competitive with urgency like oh that. Oh my God. And, so true. You know, like kids, like this, that, that house cleaning example. And now kids, like their immune systems are not being developed because they never encountered dirt because they're, they're living in these weird little like hygiene boxes. It's mm -hmm. so strange. Uh, but yeah, and and just the way that uh, all the weird stuff that we create when we create cultures between people, like I can feel urgency about doing something that I think someone else has implied that I should <laughs> be doing, whether or not they're thinking that I can get myself frothing Proper into a lather. lather. A lather. Yes, the yeah. same, same word came to both of us. 
Lather. We have that. We have a weird thing with that sometimes. Marty and I have this weird psychic thing with words every now and again. They just the same word pops into both our heads. We should talk about it sometimes. Mm, we should. I was just going to anyway, say that. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Weird stuff between people often creates false urgency. Boom. For me, it's if I think someone has made a demand, pleasing them. I used to, when you write self help, um, people write to you about their lives. And um, I remember uh, people would write in and say things like, oh, I've had a rough life or whatever. And I would, I felt so much pressure Ooh. to fix their lives. I and mean, it would be like, like 10 messages would come in from people I'd never met and suddenly, oh, they need me to help them. And it became very, very urgent. And finally, it, it was driving me to insane. So I stopped reading my own mail. And this was like snail mail. And then Karen started reading it. And she would confront me with these letters. <laughs> Marty, this woman in, you know, in Guam. Boise, Idaho. This woman, this woman in Boise, Idaho is having a really hard time with her husband. And you need to make it right. It was, <laughs> there was a lot of urgency there. A lot. It's interesting because for you, people tell you that you need to fix their lives and there's this little messiah complex part of you that totally believes Ooh. them. And then when Karen gets on board that, she also has a you messiah complex. Yes. <laughs> she, she, <laughs> like she doesn't think she's a messiah, but she does think you are. Many people do, in fairness. Yeah. I'm not one of them. But um, but anyway, look, all of that, totally agree. I think we, I think we know what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So in your job, the culture is after you to get urgent at home, in relationships, all over, there's this false urgency. But, but it was, as we started talking about this, we realized that like there is, there is an urgency that's true to Angela's point. Like, and it's a completely different beast, even mm. though we could still call it urgency. We're call- and so we're calling it like creative urgency, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's and and by creative urgency, it's funny because it for me it's like the urgency of nature. I thought about how I mean, speaking of house cleaning, right before you go into labor, if you're pregnant, you can have a baby. A lot of people have this urge to clean the house right before the baby's due. Did you have that? Oh yeah, you did. Yeah. Do you remember I cleaned out? No, it was it was when I was first pregnant, and I I really needed to clean out the fridge. But yeah, but I all, that's right. You cleaned out all the food. It was like your body was telling you only certain yeah. foods. But then, as you got to the end of the pregnancy, you did start cleaning, nesting. Like, yeah, and I really did. Like I was cleaning, moving the refrigerator to clean under it. I mean, stuff. That I typically, and I'm pregnant, you know, out to there. And there, the urgency, it felt like, well, it felt natural, but it was, yeah. it was creative in the sense that my body, your body, we, we were, they were creating babies. And this, it's sort of nature's urgency. We just watched spring sprung in Pennsylvania. And one day there were almost no leaves on the trees. And then the next day, everything was like exploding with green. And it, you can feel feel the animals the bird the birds right now in the in the springtime they're having their babies and i have to refill my bird feeders like 20 times a day because they are doing things and it it feels urgent but creative and then i was it's so cool the way that they call that pregnant thing that cleaning up when you're pregnant they call it nesting because we Mm. like we just it's such a literal comparison yeah to you know oh i need to furnish a soft and pleasant space yeah. for this creature that's coming. And, and yeah, you can see it just so directly with the birdies. Yeah, it feels very animal. But, and, and by that, I mean that as a compliment. People used to say women are closer to nature because um, they're the ones that have all these biological changes and that makes them less than the men who have pure intellect and feel no urgency pure except, testosterone except the urgency toward money anyway um so there's this nature's urgency and then it translates straight across for me into uh create like art creativity the creativity yes. of, of the arts and and letters and all the things we make when Talk about Art Toad because Art Toad is an urgent creature okay. who dwells within so, you next to your hamps- knee hamsters. From, 
um, from the time I was little and could grip a pencil in my knuckle cups. <laughs> I, oh, that's what she, God. <laughs> I didn't make that's it. That's what up. she said. It's Blame not my fault. Um, I, I drew and drew and drew and drew. And then I stopped drawing when I got older and there were more urgent things to do, like cleaning the oil spots off the road in front of our house. <laughs> and... <laughs> So I learned to be good and to, you know, I, the urgency of book deadlines, the urgency of coaching, all those things. Okay, they were okay. They were great. But then I wrote this book that, that um, talked about anxiety and how it's the opposite, not just of calm, but of creativity. And I decided... Just recently. Yeah, that, that I may have said this. Is, is her new one. Yes. And, and I may have said this before, but I gave myself a month to just rev up the right hemisphere of my brain, which is where I thought this creative impulse might live based on science so I, <laughs> based on what everyone says based on everything everybody said so <laughs> i gave myself a whole month to just do right hemisphere things and that meant i art drawing painting and then i w- i thought i'll see where i go from there and what happened was that given a full month to play the part of me that was like three years old and wanted to draw all the time rose up and it reminded me of the wind in the willows where Mr. Toad is obsessed with driving a motor car. <laughs> this is, cars were very... Boop, 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 boop. And he, he get, he's so obsessed that he steals cars and they end up putting him in prison. And then he disguises himself as a washerwoman and he gets out. And then there are people who go by in a motor car and he asks for a ride. He's still dressed as a, a washerwoman. And then he asks if he can drive the car. And he's being very timid and nice and pretending to be the washerwoman. And they let him drive the car. And as soon as Fools. he's... Mm, as soon as he starts to drive, the mania takes him. And he like whips off his wig and he goes, ha ha, washerwoman indeed. I am the fabulous toad. You will see what driving really is. And he goes completely nuts with this car. Drives it around at a very frantic speed until he drives it into a hedge. Um, but he's almost, he's literally insane with joy. Yeah. That is what happened to me Happened to me when I started to draw for a whole month. Art Toad got out of its cage. And it won't go back in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. my goodness. The need to draw and paint is so urgent to me that it is almost like the need to breathe. It's it, and, and it's, it's strange. It is strange, and it's so interesting how it go. It often does go against those social norms. Mm-hmm. You know, if we're talking about culture is built with false urgency, true urgency often like won't make sense to our cultural part, which is yeah. why you need to like have a toad to to carry it because the toad is like, I don't care. I am going to draw, yeah, and paint. But pictures. no, it wouldn't have. I would have crunched him back down if you had not said this urgency must be respected and you Hmm. said get up every morning you get to draw and paint till 11 o'clock like you get up at whatever time you want but we will take care of everything work child everything till 11 and you get to draw and paint every morning and because once in a while we uncover (sighs) something that feels both urgent and important and that is what this art is for you. And you're a new person since you've been doing it, this. It's amazing. I still can't quite believe it's true, but it is like I've been trying to breathe through a like gag or something and it's been taken yeah. out and I can just breathe. And most of the stuff I make is crap and I throw it away, but I keep <sighs> learning. And I, it still feels urgent, but there's a container for it. So the panic, there used to be a panic that I would not have a container for my urgency. I wouldn't. So you had false urgency about not being able to Uh um, house the the object of your real urgency. That's kind of Yeah, and every day I get up and I'm so besotted with this whole thing. I mean, just everything about it is just, it just feeds every bit of me. But I still keep thinking, but what's urgent? Okay, who needs me? Uh oh, Lila's crying. I probably should go down there. Oh gosh, I should. Oh, I should really edit my book more. Or you know, all these things. What's urgent? What's urgent? What's so urgent? I can't be the art toad. And not all the time though, because I think sometimes you do get lost in it, and it becomes everything, and you stop thinking that mm-hmm. about you. Start you switch off that part of you that that is 
um, subject to false urgency. And I feel I'm like not there's something in control, really. I mean, it. I go. Compl- I lose time. I go completely into it. I'm unaware of anything but the joy of this, the the, the force that through the green fuse drives the flower. Sort of, the force is working with me. And then I'll drop in and go, oh, oh, social urgency. What am I looking at? It's, I'm really still not balancing it very easily. Yeah, it's an interesting yeah. process to watch. We'll have to keep checking in with the listeners and telling them about how, how you go with this ongoing experiment because yeah. it's super interesting. Damn, it feels I just wonder, I, yeah. I feel like there's something here about, like, it, like what you're describing is flow, is that like mm, very yeah. commonly cited. Mihai chicks and my me hi chicks and me hi yeah. um uh with where time disappears and everything but i just wonder because we talk more about neurodivergency now and mm-hmm. and since our episode the other butterflies um and on, and you know one of the the super powers of of neurodivergency is often um hyper focus um and i am just exploring this myself right now so um I, this is very different from your like spectacular <laughs> uh, world class well, yeah. art, but I started doing beading because I like it, and I bead a, you know the little needle and I bead my little beads right, and it's so audio medium. Audio I was medium. just showing the bracelets to people who may possibly see the pictures. Okay, um, so <laughs> I'm so sorry. It felt to- urgent. Okay, all right. <laughs> Anyway, I so I experience this when I go into my little my own little beading toad mm-hmm. self where that where time disappears and I stay up very late and I don't care. I just yeah. don't care because I'm so and there's something so present about it. Like it's very rare for me even in meditation to feel as present as I do when I'm when I'm doing this little task that is only about beauty. Yeah. And is is very like it's it's not inspired and yet it it inspires me and i just feel like there's some really deep wisdom here in this state that we're describing about the role of art in our lives and i agree we're going to wait 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 gotta, uh, there's one thing i got to say about this that beads I was, one of our friends kate hi kate Cullen, um i was telling her about your beading and she said here's the thing you could dig up an egyptian um, tomb from 5,000 years ago and there would be beads in it. And you could get something from the Aztecs and there would be beads in it and they would be the same kinds. They There would be no real difference. Like people have been doing this. There must be urgency. And no one needed it. We started, we were joking about how beading is like making these things that are both precious and pointless. <laughs> like I love that. You know, like, and that's what they were doing in Egypt. And that's what they were doing is, is making something that everyone knows is both precious and, and pointless. And maybe that's what all art is. And maybe that's what all real urgency is. But we're going to figure this all out right after this. So Angela was asking us how to know when we need to move on urgency as as something that has information for us and and when to be suspicious of it as Mm. a kind of tool or or weapon (laughs) of the culture. So, Marty, how do we decide what urgent really means and how do we discern creative urgency from false urgency? Uh, I think the the key, you can feel it. And the key point is that false urgency comes from fear. In fact, it's it's actually kind of a form of fear, fear that, oh, I've got to get this done. And often it's only triggered by interactions with other people, like advertisers, man, your bosses, government. They can create false ener- urgency by triggering anxiety. If you don't do this, something bad will happen. Mm. The moment we're in anxiety urgency, we're out of creativity urgency. Mm. Um, and they don't feel the same creativity um urgency when you go with it is nourishing and you find yourself making things and the other one is is draining and you're doing things for other people that they think is desirable or beautiful but not yourself so it's kind Mm. of the difference between crushed down by a heavy load and being 
huh, almost like a rocket being lifted up by, um, you know, the explosion of rocket fuel towards something yeah. that you love. Yeah, like for me, there's a focus on the thing itself mm. and not like if I think about that work panic I was having the other day, it was like, I've got to get this done. What is it? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's got to be done. It's got to be behind me. The thing, the urgent, urgent thing. And whereas when I'm doing something driven by my creative urgency, it's all about that thing. It's not this huge wall ahead of me. Yeah. Um, it just is. It's just being lost in a really, really profound present moment. Yeah. With this one little thing, whatever it is, it could be beads, it could be a painting, it could be like... But it also could be like life changes that people go through. And I wonder if this is maybe where Angela was was sort of going with it. Like mm -hmm. if you feel an urgency to uh, move house, move right. to another part of right. I've the felt country that. or another country. Right. Or just to travel for its own sake, which I know you've felt a lot. And so how would you, if it was about moving or travel, travel I don't think works as well, but moving house, okay. like when, how would you just decide whether moving house is, is, is creative urgency or? Well, are you moving urgency? out of a sense of anxiety because you want to have a better house that will please people or you need to be in the place, like the part of town that's prestigious or someone wants you to move versus... Do you love the place to which you are going? Does do, does it feel like the an expansion of your soul to go on from one place that was home to another place that will be home? If it feels like a push and you're doing it for other people and you feel drained by it, that urgency, I'd say, is the false urgency. And that sense of, oh, like when we moved here, I moved to California with the feeling of expansion. And then I moved away from California to Pennsylvania with the same feeling of, oh, it's the next adventure, right? Mm, it was urgent, mm. but it wasn't draining. It was exciting. You know what's fascinating if we imagine these two types of urgency as like two states of being almost. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what's interesting is that when you're in the culture's urgency, you're not actually available to respond fluidly and spontaneously mm -hmm. to creative mm -hmm. urgency when yes. it strikes because uh, because you build all these inflexible structures yep. around you within yep. cultural, false, social yeah. um yeah, fake urgency. So before we can even step into uh, responding to our creative urgency, we need to sort of relax and step back a bit from the yeah. the false urgency or we won't recognize the real thing oh, when that's it comes. really true. If you are living a life driven by false urgency, don't look for creative, creativity urgency because you won't be able to feel it. Pull back mm. first, get to a place where you're not urgent at all, and then see what what comes up from inside, because other I think the culture's investment in us is to steal our creativity urgency by mm. pushing us into anxiety to produce what it wants. So, yeah. what that means is, if you get some space and you allow that creativity to arise within you, it's going to take courage to serve that creative urgency. And you've been showing. I mean, it sounds so stupid, but I get frightened that I'm doing the wrong thing painting every day. It yeah. takes courage to keep going when I've so internalized the culture's models of what I'm supposed to be doing. That's true. It does take courage. It really takes courage. So, and that's a, so that's a sign you're on the right track, right? If you <laughs> have so, to be brave okay, to be I just want to point out that other people are using courage to do much harder things. I'm so brave. I just do watercolors all day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's fair the the point you're making, but it's also a, a, a truth. We it we is. have we have to um, exercise courage on all kinds of levels. So, yeah. um, and I just want to say in answer to Angela's question, maybe one way to think about it is like the feeling of true urgency is that you're drawn toward the thing, mm -hmm. and it's pulling you toward it. You're not having to push past oh, it like so me true. with my my brand updates. So true. And for me, there's this feeling of going into light and delight. And it, it, it sounds trivial to do, to do beads, to do watercolors, to do songs and dances or whatever it is. But I don't think it is. There's this wonderful poem, The Case for the Defense by Jack Gilbert, where he talks about um, the awful things in the world. And then he says, we actually have to follow 
the things that give us delight in order to give significance to human life in general and to give freedom to people who have suffered and are suffering. And he says, I think this is how I want to go forward with my own creativity urgency. He says, we must risk delight. We can do without pleasure, but not delight, not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of the world. And it's like all that, the ruthless furnace of pressure to do other things. And we need to like push it aside and step into our own delight. And when we can do that, we know that we'll be able to stay stay wild. wild. (laughs) We hope you're enjoying Bewildered. If you're in the USA and want to be notified when a new episode comes out, text the word WILD to 570-873-0144. We're also on Instagram. Our handle is Bewildered Podcast. You can follow us to get updates, hear funny snippets and outtakes, and chat with other fans of the show. Bewildered is produced by Scott Forster with support from the brilliant team at MBI. And remember, if you're having fun, please rate and review and stay wild.